Okay, so we'll just make a start. Um, I'm Martina Blake. I'm Services Manager with um, Arthritis Ireland, and you're all very welcome. Um, I'm just going to keep talking as people are coming in. It's all good. Um, and just make sure you get yourselves comfortable. And the first things first, you're very welcome to uh, Arthritis Ireland Breaking the Pain Cycle webinar series. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have this finally here. Um, and you're, uh, you know, it, it's really good. We've got uh, session one coming up now and it's shortly. So I just want to go through a couple of housekeeping um, things. So for anybody new to Arthritis Ireland, uh, we're the national charity for people living with arthritis. And we deliver support, training, education and information uh, to people living with arthritis and their families. So in case anybody didn't know as well, we have a, a helpline, which is open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 for support information and to find out more about what we do or to register for courses. OK, so just um, as part of uh, my introduction, just to let you know, the, the workshop or the webinar tonight is due to last one hour and we've plenty of time for questions and answers. So just on that, as, as in terms of housekeeping, um, if you see the chat function at the bottom right hand side there, uh, you can pop any questions that you do have in the bottom of the screen. And Peter, my colleague here, is going to line up the questions for us so that we can ask Barry as well. Um, and if there's any slides there that are of particular interest um, or on a topic that you're interested in, take a screenshot or take a photo of it. Um, and just to let you know, too, um, if you drop off or if something comes up, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. And it'll also be emailed out to you next week. And before I go any further, I'd like to thank Frenicius Cabby for their support of our webinar series. And um, without them, we wouldn't be having this this evening. Um, so that's me for now. So it leaves me very little else to do other than to hand you over to our first speaker of the webinar series, Dr. Barry O'Shea. And his uh, presentation is on arthritis and pain. So thank you, Barry. No worries. Hang on there now. Let me... Okay, um, thank you very much, Martina and Peter and all the team in Arthritis Ireland for giving me the chance to talk on this today. So this series is very interesting. Pain is without a doubt our most challenging symptom that we have to manage in the um, arthritis clinic in various rheumatology departments all around the country. Um, so like the kind of grandiose title, title of breaking the pain cycle, so no, um, no, only a small challenge there. Um, anyway, I'm going to run through a few bits and pieces and hopefully leave uh, plenty of time for questions. So um, as Martina said, uh, feel free to uh, put your uh, questions so we can get, get on um, and answer those. The way I've tried to divide the, or divide up the talk, I suppose I am going to talk a little bit about the pain cycle. Um, but really, just as a starting place for us to talk about pain in general, there's a lot of more, a lot of interesting talks coming up over the next few weeks on uh, medications and exercise and all these sort of things. So they'll be valuable. I'll touch on each of those. Um, but obviously, there'll be more information as the uh, as the, the series uh, continues. Um, as I've gone through things, like we look after a lot of conditions, as people know here uh, on this webinar, probably with various forms of arthritis. Some are more challenging than others. Um, uh, huge strides have been made in some of our inflammatory conditions with the advent of lots of biologics. Um, so they are in some ways are a bit easier. So I've actually avoided those. Um, that's not to say that people don't have pain with them. But um, as I'm going through the conditions, I've concentrated more on back pain and osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia, just to give us um, a flavor of what, uh, what we do. So that's who I am. I am a rheumatologist in uh, St. James's Hospital. Um, OK, so let's uh, kick things off. So pain, um, obviously, in its simplest form, in its acute form, it is, I think this, yeah, this next slide has a definition uh, on it. So an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience that's associated with or resembles that associated with actual or even potential tissue damage. So that's kind of a funny way of putting, but it is, but in its simplest form, if we look at this diagram, um, 
and we come in contact with a painful stimuli, whether that's you know, a fire or boiling water or something sharp uh, and our nervous system kicks in, the fibers up to our brain, we feel pain and an automatic response to withdraw our hand, withdraw our foot from the sharp object. Um, and that's, so it, it is a protective mechanism that has stood us well as a species for many, many millennia. Um, and so that's good pain. That's um, what's allowed us to evolve. Um, but what we are talking about is obviously a little bit different and it's where things go wrong. So, um, so what I've described there is really around the area of acute pain. And, and I suppose what we are more interested in, in is how that might develop into chronic pain. So obviously acute pain, recent onset, there's a very specific triggering event usually, possibly a structural damage. Think of falling over and fracturing your arm or your hip. A broken bone is going to elicit pain. But gradually over time, there is a recovery, a healing, and things get better. That's what should happen. That's normal pain, I suppose, for want of a better word. But I suppose if we have a situation where this pain then develops into a more chronic pattern present for longer than a few months, the triggering event may be long gone. Um, and even the structural changes may no longer be there. And But this pain isn't getting better and it persists. So we're into kind of a chronic pain scenario. And that's what we deal with a lot of the time in uh, the arthritis world. So that's of most interest to us. Um, if you Google, it's amazing. If you Google the pain cycle, there must be thousands of diagrams of the pain cycle that look some version of this. You start up the top corner there, you have pain, and that then kind of triggers a reflex in us to protect ourselves, stop moving the affected area. Our muscles start to get a bit weakened. They lose mobility. They get weak. They waste. That in turn causes functional problems. That in call, turn then causes a lot of stress and that amplifies the pain. So this is the standard pain cycle. As I said, there are lots of versions of this. I prefer this one a little bit because it really kind of um, it, it is more useful thinking in the world of arthritis. So we start at the top again, a persistent pain. The effect that it has on activity is probably the most marked thing that I see. People become less active. People less start reducing their walking. People protect their joints, understandably. And then, but with that goes problems. We lose our fitness. We lose muscle strength. Our muscles tend to stiffen. Um, that feeds in then to sleep um, problems. Um, that then feeds into tiredness. And then that we're into that whole area of stress and anxiety and anger and all that goes with it. Throw in on top of that then are some of the medications we might use and potential side effects from those, sleep disturbance and such. And all of that in the setting of poor sleep and loss of function and reduced mobility, then we're into weight gain. And not surprisingly, then we feed into like low mood, the impact all these may have on our work or our life or school or college, um, our job, financial issues, our personal issues, our family relationships. Uh, and then you get this amplification of pain. So really, um, it kind of, um, uh, you know, it really is well demonstrated, I think, in, in, in this version here. The issue, I suppose, is that, yeah, unfortunately, we, at chronic pain, we live in this side of the graph as opposed to this side, which is kind of normal, that acute pain setting, an injury, as we said, a broken bone, uh, a burnt hand. Um, we confront it, we start to address it and gradually get recurrence and the pain is gone. That's what we look for. But frequently we're into this side here, you know, um, catastrophizing and um, fear of pain, we become defensive, fear avoidance, muscle disuse, which can lead to disability, low mood and into this cycle. So this is the problem that we live in. OK, so um, just what is the story of pain, different types of pain? I've mentioned some of this already. We refer to that acute pain, that you know, you know, standing on a sharp piece of glass, that breaking of a bone, or that touching a fire as nociceptive acute pain. It elicits an automatic or almost automatic reflex of withdrawal. The chronic pain that we mentioned going on longer. 
You can have specific scenarios or specific pain where you get neuropathic or nerve pain. Um, this doesn't isn't by any means confined to the arthritis world. You know, conditions such as poorly controlled diabetes, and uh, that can lead to nerve damage, and that results in neuropathic pain. But you can also get neuropathic pain in the arthritis world. So that's kind of pure nerve damage eliciting it. Then this, excuse me, then this really interesting phenomenon of kind of central sensitization. So this idea that we um, some, something happens, some sort of a dysfunction in our central nervous system, so in our brain, um, where the signals become somewhat distorted. Sometimes you can appreciate that as an amplification. So, um, and even though the stimulus may be gone, that they get amplified and it keeps on and the pain sensation um, persists. And this can happen not alone in adults, but there's studies out there that this can even also happen in, in, in children as well. Um, frequently, it tends to be persistent pain, but even chronic pain can be episodic. Um, and it can affect single areas of the body, like a hand or foot, but it can be more generalized, as, as, as we'll see as we go through this. Um, complex pain, and we know we're into the situation of complex pain when we start to have a significant impairment in how we function. Um, if we're in school or if we're in college or if we're in work and how that how that is impaired. Um, our recreational activities, our hobbies, our things that we get enjoyment from. Um, our family life, our personal life, our friends, our relationships. When we're having impairment of all these, we are certainly in the situation of, of complex pain. Um, and obviously when we're trying to manage that, um, we need to take on board and totally accept and know the patients have pain but how to deal with that and still look at functional improvements as much as possible, actually. Um, so these are some of the questions that I kind of thought about. I've actually answered some of them already, but just kind of as we go through uh, the talk today, going obviously see the purpose of pain. We know what the purpose of pain is in its original acute setting. It's a protective mechanism. Does pain mean tissue damage? We'll try and address that, not necessarily. What's the role of the physical and emotional side of things? Where do they meet? What about um, your own personal history, medical history, or personal history might have on the severity of pain? This idea we frequently hear it like, oh, I have a high pain threshold or I have a low pain threshold. What, what does that mean? The whole issue that I get a lot of time in clinic is about scans and x-rays and MRIs and CTs and or how, what role they play. If you have something like osteoarthritis, do you automatically have pain? Um, and what is the role of weight and weight gain on, on pain? So I'm gonna try and go through some of these as we go through the rest of the talk. So this is the world I live in. I live and work in an arthritis clinic and rheumatology clinic, and I see patients with generalized musculoskeletal issues uh, all the time. As you'll see, pretty much in that center green box is um, the issues that come from having arthritis and pain is very much up there at the top. Not the only one by any means, but it is up there. It is interesting just even the terminology and when you talk to patients that, you know, ache and pain and even stiffness. And sometimes they can be confused in people's mind, which is understandable. I suppose it's our job as the as the doctors and the healthcare professionals and the nurse specialists and the physios and the OTs to tease it out a little bit more. People might mean, oh my they might be describing stiffness, but it's actually pain and vice versa. Um, but OK, so there are the issues. And then we have to take all of those into account um, when I'm trying to come up with a management plan and um, taking totally into um, bearing in mind their level of pain, the choosing of medications, you know, what they might need in terms of splints or insoles, what about their role of exercise, healthy eating, stress, stress management, fatigue. Um, so they're all the things um, that play a role, hopefully getting the patient in its entirety better, but with a particular focus obviously um, on pain. And that might be aches and it might mean stiffness as well. Um, so the osteoarthritis world, so I picked that as a kind of a good example of where to kick things off. So pain is a central feature down there at the bottom, but how do we get to that? And there are different ways. We know that as we get older, you know, so there's a predisposition to osteoarthritis. As we get older, it's more likely. There is a genetic predisposition and background to it as well. 
but also then on the right you can see things about abnormal joint biomechanics but that would be specifically means something's gone wrong with our normal joint um, has it been injured has there been an injury in the past where the cartilage has been damaged um, is that joint being overloaded you know whether that's by a physical force it might be your job if you're a, a, you know, a builder or, or, or a farmer and doing lots of physical work and um, does the joint become in, un, um, unstable as well so all of these feed then down into this kind of pathway where our immune system and our inflammatory system plays some of havoc on our joints and we get osteoarthritis and pain is frequently but as we'll see shortly not always the major feature but that in itself, we know we need to take into account even the pain in terms of um, how to assess that and how to come up with a management plan, bringing into account people's comorbidities. Um, are they disabled by their arthritis? Um, and those sort of factors are important in, in, in dealing with it, really. Um, so in the world of osteoarthritis, what's the risk factors for it? Some of them are modifiable. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about aging. I wish we could, um, but certainly as we get older, and um, we know um, that there's a steady increase in the, um, in the prevalence of osteoarthritis, our muscles get weaker. Unfortunately, we know that as a fact as well. Um, and muscle weakness, particularly after the age of 50, there is a steady decline in muscle strength. Um, but we can't do, you know, and we're limited to what we can do about aging, I'm afraid. Gender as well, women are more likely to get osteoarthritis and particularly in a in the menopause and the perimenopausal period that can exacerbate symptoms. And as I said earlier, there is a hereditary component. Some forms of osteoarthritis just run in families and some don't. Um, we can't do anything about some of these. A lot of the more modifiable ones, at least for us to, to, to try and address, obviously um, obesity, and that's down to a purely a loading um, issue on our joints, particularly in the knee. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, occupations, certain occupations. Now, I've been listed under modifiable, but they may not be. If that's your job, that's your job. Um, diet, um, um, certainly in certain parts of the world, vitamin C can play a role in bone. Bone health, vitamin D is really important in bone health and bone strength. So there are things that we can um, uh, address. Um, so this is just, I'm just putting this up here as, you know, we love an old x-ray in the rheumatology clinic. Um, so this is just an example of how we compare here. We have a nice normal looking knee joint x-ray. What I look for is this nice big space here because this is full of cartilage, which we don't really see in an x-ray, but I like to see space because that means I've got lots of cartilage and I should have very little problems in that knee. And then obviously if we compare it to this lad next door, uh, the space is almost completely obliterated, certainly on the medial or the inside bit, which is where it's first, maybe a little bit preserved on the outside. But as you can imagine, the famous you know, it isn't necessarily a terrible, uh, it isn't, isn't a useful term sometimes, you know, this bone on bone, you could see how there might, I'm not going to say definitely be pain, but might be pain in this instance here. But it's not as clear cut as that, and that's the issue. And these are just some cases from my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Canan in James's, um, who frequently puts these up in our teaching sessions. And these are two separate cases that, um, that she has been looking after. So I'm thinking back to, if we take the one on the right first, relatively relatively okay knee joints. As I say, if you just hone in, what we look for is space. We like space because space is full of cartilage and cartilage is good. So still certainly reasonable space here and stuff. And if you compare it to this patient here, who's literally down to bone on bone, um, so cartilage and all the rest of it. But as she highlights, this patient was having these knee x-rays for something completely different and had very little or no pain. And this patient with relatively good x-rays had awful pain. So we can't always equate the x-ray severity with the, the symptoms. And that's what makes things challenging. So obviously then when we're trying to come up with a plan, we need to bear this in mind. And educating our patients is part of that. Uh, about the disease, concentrating maybe on what's modifiable, being realistic about what's not modifiable or non-modifiable, I should say. 
Um, also people's perception, that isn't every form of arthritis isn't the same. And if you have osteoarthritis, it's not the same as rheumatoid arthritis. And you might have heard of your friend or your relative that's on a new biologic for rheumatoid and you want to know why it won't work for osteo and unfortunately it won't. But then it does very much bring us back to controlling pain, ultimately to improve function because they are totally linked and to try as much as possible to slow down the kind of the, 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 the disease kind of process and progress. So we do a lot of non-pharmacological, -pharma non-medical stuff to try and address this education, as I say. I work very close with physiotherapy. I'm a big fan and a big believer in physiotherapy, physical therapies, physical interventions, exercise, mobilizing, um, keeping joints moving, keeping muscles moving, keeping strength as much as possible. That can take lots of forms. Uh, people do it in the pool, hydrotherapy, swimming. Um, obviously local interventions then, lots of people, let's say on this, will have different interventions, a TENS machine, ultrasound machine, different versions of that. Um, occupational therapy and joint protection and splints is really important. But everything, I've sent patients for everything on this screen, um, massage, acupuncture, TENS machine, they all, they all, they all play a role. Um, there's going to be separate talks in this series on medications, but I just to mention them briefly, to start, uh, we work our way through, we have a selection of medications and not everyone, is, not every agent is suitable for every patient, but um, it's important to start low and build ourselves up. Um, people frequently kind of, you know, kind of look down on the nose and paracetamol. And I, I, I get that, but I think a lot of time that's because it's not taken properly. It's not the strongest medication in the world, but if you take it frequently and regularly, it will have a pain blocking effect. You know, being in a terrible, getting yourself in terrible pain and then taking two paracetamol and not wondering why it hasn't worked isn't necessarily terribly fair, as opposed to taking it daily and weekly and gradually building that pain under control. But different versions of it, we combine codeine with it in some instances. Um, we use anti-inflammatories, topicals, sometimes oral. We have some not that keen on using prolonged courses of oral anti-inflammatories because of their side effects. We have potentially stronger opiates. Again, if possible, we try and avoid those because they will issue kind of tolerance that kind of develops over time. Depending on the type of pain, if it's more kind of neuropathic pain, we might call on some of these other agents, the amitriptylines, the gabapentins, the pregabalins, although over time I'm using less and less pregabalin. Um, um, but then even interventions like directly into a joint, if a joint, a knee, that bad knee, would you try something intra-articular into the joint, steroids, and there's other preparations that more so that maybe my orthopedic colleagues use, you know, various hyaluronic acids um, that are used to treat it. So there we have a, we have an array of medications, as you will hear over the next, uh, uh, next week. So I'm still staying in the degenerative osteoarthritis world, I'm talking about back pain now. Um, because back pain um, is one of the most common musculoskeletal complaints out there, one of the most common reasons to go to primary care or general practice. But it is challenging, and this is uh, some of the reasons why. This is a study done a few years ago. They took patients and they did x-rays on them and divided them into age groups. So these were people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, their 80s, um, and looked for various things that we see on back x-rays, disc degeneration, disc bulge, disc protrusion, like things that we are maybe used to hearing and seeing in x-ray reports. And not surprisingly, as we go up the decades, they become 80, 90 percent, 70, 80, 90, you know, disproved 60, 70, 84 percent in your 80s. I will point out this feature here. All of these patients were asymptomatic. They x-rayed asymptomatic people and they found lots and lots and lots of back problems structurally. So back like those last patients uh, with the knee x-rays, they don't always add up. Um, so this, so they were, that was a plain x-ray study. This is more of an MRI study. And again, trying to equate or correlate um, the MRI findings and the intensity of pain, the quality of life and the result of the anxiety and depression that goes with it, that there was no association with the MRI findings. 
This was a really interesting study, then the reverse of it, if you think. So this was a study that was done um, at the 2016 Olympic, Olympic Games. Um, so high-end athletes doesn't get any doesn't get any better than being an Olympian. Um, so you think these people must be absolutely at the peak of um, their physical state. Um, and they MRI them. Um, in their neck, in their thoracic or mid-back, in their lumbar or lower back. Um, so these are percentages percentage of people that had abnormalities or degenerative disc disease. Now, a good chunk were mild, um, but the orange is moderate and the grey is severe. So this is pushing 10% and this is pushing 5%. So 15% of Olympians, <laughs> so performing at that level, had um, moderate to severe degenerative changes in their lumbar spine. So again, just showing that it doesn't always um, uh, equate. Um, this was another study, again, looking at MRIs of people's neck, and they were asymptomatic, and they divided their, their um, patients into those who were less than 40, 14% of abnormal MRIs, and over 40, 28%. So is it, so they are like, are you abnormally normal? Are you actually just normally abnormal? Are we all, do we all have some abnormalities? So back to say that is there an over-reliance on um, MRIs going, oh, I have an MRI and it shows this. Is this my problem? That's not to say. Scan x-rays, CTs, MRIs are important, and we do a lot of them, and they are certainly important um, when there are what we call red flags, so they're symptoms suggestive of something else. When we want to outrule like an infection or outrule a tumour or outrule an acute injury or an, a fracture or something, scans and x-rays are important. But a lot of the time they may not be because people can get, oh, I, um, you know, just become super aware that they have a scan that shows they have degenerative changes, but that's not necessarily the cause of their pain. Uh, biomechanics is important in loading, and um, um, this is just study and work that's being done on weight and weight gain and carrying extra weight. Um, and this nice study that showed for extra every extra five kilograms of weight that we carry increases your risk of low back pain. And it purely is a loading factor. You know, um, a thin um, fellow like this distributes weight normally onto his pelvis. Um, through his lumbar spine. But as you gain more weight, particularly as it becomes um, in the abdominal region, that tilts us forward and it alters the angle of our pelvis and it alters the mechanics on our lower back um, and puts extra pressure on our hips and therefore our knees. So it's just simple um, physics um, of how we load the joints. Um, so that was my kind of overview. This wasn't meant to be a, a, a definitive talk in osteoarthritis, but I just wanted to talk about some of the conditions where it plays a role. So that was osteoarthritis leading into back pain. Uh, one of the other areas we see a lot of where um, uh, pain, chronic pain is an issue is fibromyalgia. Um, people have a lot of kind of diffuse, generalized stiffness in as well as their pain. And remember, sometimes the terminology is really important to get people to describe what they mean, going, I'm really stiff. And they're actually really sore when they say they're really stiff. Um, and fatigue, and I'm going to talk a bit about fatigue in a minute. Fatigue feeds into unrefreshed sleep. Um, there's this issue of specific tender or trigger points. Um, uh, this idea of primary and secondary fibromyalgia. Um, primary is quite common, secondary I see as well, secondary to one of our rheumatological conditions, um, and a condition that's much more common in our female than our male patients. So those classical tender or trigger points that we use to assess people, marked on this graph here, back of the back of the neck, uh, the front of the, um, the your clavicles, your elbows, your knees, around your pelvis. Um, but it is a diffuse pain. People can get pain in other areas, this, not just these, um, tr um, these trigger or tender points. Um, there's different features that we look for in the setting of this diffuse tissue pain. Yes, in a characteristic location, but the stiffness, the fatigue, the poor sleep, 
association with irritable bowel, migraines, even rhinos or circulation issues. Um, it is challenging, and I think it's important to kind of educate patients about that, that this isn't, there's no quick fix for this patient, but just to take this on board and to set realistic and slow goals and say that this is a, it's a slow bicycle race, not a sprint. We really need to set goals that will get us there slowly. Um, medications play a role, education, exercise, stress management, they all feed in back into that, think back to that cycle, they all feed into it. Um, so again, a lot of these medications you've heard of already, I've mentioned in the osteoarthritis, there's nothing majorly different. Uh, we try and avoid anti-inflammatories, certainly oral anti-inflammatories, because there's really no major benefit um, proven. Topical, we tend to use maybe a little bit more. Um, back to these kind of neuropathic or neurotransmitter blockade um, type medications I mentioned, um, at aim at reducing reducing the pain. We also can um, help with the sleep. They're divided into different categories, amitriptyline. These medications are used in different dosing and different settings to treat anti anti um, or antidepressives um, called SSRIs, and these neuropathic agents, the pregabalins and the gabapentins. Um, so bringing the patient along the journey is so important in this in this setting. Um, the role of sleep, exercise, stress management, all these things is really, really important. Um, exercise, as I said earlier, I'm a big fan, a big advocate of physical therapy, physical therapy, physical interventions in all shapes and forms, hydrotherapy, land-based, um, trying to address cardiovascular health. Um, it really is um, the kind of cornerstone of management. Um, trying to uh, address the psychological impact of this condition is really important, and also maybe the psychological triggers. Um, so cognitive, the various cognitive behavioral interventions that can play a role uh, are listed here, so they are important um, um, as well. Fatigue. So if any of our conditions can have issues with fatigue, but if ever there's one, it's fibromyalgia because of the sleep disturbance and the um, then the fatigue and the exacerbation that that causes in musculoskeletal symptoms. Um, I thankfully am not doing on any overnight call rotas anymore, but I absolutely remember um, my nights on call where your sleep would be disturbed and you would wake up the following morning and just, just with a generalized ache, ache in all your muscles. And that's after one night. Can you imagine the amplification of night after night after night of poor sleep? Um, so poor sleep and fatigue are, 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 are really important. Um, it affects concentration, ability to make decisions, frustration, and stresses on family life, personal life. It's just it's just unbelievable, really. Um, trying to get into a better pattern and habit um, is important. This idea of sleeping not too much either, um, waking after a set number of hours and getting up so that you kind of fatigue yourself naturally to sleep the following night. Um, if you're not active enough during the day, there isn't that physical tiredness that goes with it. Um, but balancing that between everyday activities, what's the environment are you in? If people can't sleep if they're in a noisy, crowded environment, um, if they're stressed, if they're worried as well. Um, this is, in some ways, obviously uh, not possible to do all of these on the slide, but in terms of this is what I try and get into the habit of kind of talking to my patients and talking about fatigue and the effect that fatigue has on pain and what's driving that pain and fatigue is poor sleep and the so-called sleep hygiene um, things to uh, avoid uh, if at all possible are there on the bottom. Um, yeah, so the cat naps during the day aren't great. Um, sugary, sugary drinks, heavy meals, late at night, caffeine, a big no-no. Try and avoid, if at all possible, late, late evening exercise. We like exercise, but like it earlier in the day. Um, overstimulation with television or screens um, um, uh, and alcohol. So these are all things to try and avoid. Um, these are things to try and do. So the opposite, I suppose, the 
getting your exercise earlier in the day and uh, whatever controls your and relaxes you naturally chamomile lavender and um, sometimes and these won't all look for for everyone but you know milky drinks listen to relaxing music maybe reading and um, so there are things to do these are the do's down here are the don'ts and then obviously being in the right environment is kind of important having your bed comfortable having it not too hot not too cold nice and quiet nice and dark if that's your thing and stuff so um easier said than done easier said than done to address these but it is really uh, critical or crucial in trying to um address the fatigue because the fatigue the tiredness and the poor sleep is totally wrapped up in our pain and pain perception. Um, we need to attack this at a multidisciplinary level, really. Um, different people take input from different people. I work closely with nurse specialists, with physios and OTs and my uh, other medical colleagues to try and um, address these. And that really has been the cornerstone of any sort of success. Um, if possible, to rely on psychological support, psychological assessment, or psycho the psychology um, of it, if that's the issue. Is, but you know, patients in chronic pain, patients with all these issues, not surprisingly, socially they will get into differences, whether that's financially, out of work, um, or you know, all the things that go with it. So social work is is important, um, and on instances, obviously, we we work with our colleagues in the pain team, and I great colleagues that work with me and stuff, they, they are under-resourced and hugely busy. So a lot of their focus is very much where there's specific interventions to be done. I, I, I talk to them a lot and I know they would love to work more in this interdisciplinary psychosocial model, but just pressures of work is difficult. So sometimes when people hear I'm going to go to the pain team, I have to... Um, bring down their expectations somewhat it, it sounds great in theory and I know my colleagues would like it to be better but they there's so few of them that they really are focusing on interventions a lot of the time okay we're coming towards the end of my talk then so back to what is the story with these uh questions that I put up early in my talk purpose of pain yes it's complex but in its simplest terms it is a warning system it is a protective mechanism it has stood us in good stead from for centuries and will continue to do that so that's what is there but it's when pain goes wrong and um, is the um, is the issue does pain always mean tissue damage not necessarily yes it can be triggered by a fracture by a burn and uh, yes it can be triggered by arthritis um but even when we get that arthritis under control so it doesn't always mean pain isn't always bad doesn't mean there's tissue damage ongoing people get saying oh my arm is sore something must be going on i must protect it and that's not necessarily always the case um pain is both physical and emotional you can't you can't separate them truly we we get a stimulus whether it's in our arthritic joint but we feel it in our brains that's where we feel pain um and all the stuff that goes on in our brains it's not you can't divorce the emotion side of it um of course then like we live in a complicated world we have complicated lives complicated past medical histories and situations that are unique to each of us so to think that everyone would have the same pain is just not the case so our personal our own history influences us hugely in that in that respect um so this idea, I tend, you know, and I, I hear it a lot, pain, oh, I have a high pain threshold or I have a low pain threshold. And very, very few people tell me they have a low pain threshold, but lots of people tell me they have a high pain threshold. Um, and yeah, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, I think people have different stories and their lives are different. So this idea that um, you have a high pain threshold and I don't, or you have a low pain threshold and I do, um, it's really, it, 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 that's a little bit simplified it is in there in terms of your kind of complicated where complicated beings and pain is complicated um i mentioned a little bit about scans and they have a role some of the time um as i say when we need to outrule things and when we need kind of clarity on a, a severe situation but a lot of the time i can pretty much know what's going on without scans um and sometimes i can leave to a little bit of friction between my seven patients going, I want an MRI. Um, and you know, 
back and forth going, I, I pretty much can tell you what I think will be on it, and it probably won't change the management hugely. But obviously, there are certain people develop an acute change in their symptoms. They get an acute neurological symptom in their leg, new pain, very severe, lose their reflexes. Yes, scans are important then because maybe something acutely has happened, a disc. Um, if you have osteoarthritis, do you have pain? Well, I think I've shown you from this the, the studies of back pain and athletes and Olympians and people with arthritic knees that not everyone with arthritis has pain. Um, some will, some won't. Um, the issue of weight certainly um, does play a role, and that's just a simple physical loading, physical altering our biomechanics, and that's why I, I know it's, uh, I never make it sound easy because I know it's not. Weight reduction is not easy in any shape or form, but anything that you can do, any tiny amount that you, do, that you can do in terms of weight reduction is less loading and gradually that will improve things. So, um, but I know it's not easy. All right, that was a bit of a wander through the uh, world of pain, my perception of what the pain cycle is and how it fits with our arthritic conditions. And I try to pick the common ones, but also the ones that don't have the fancy treatments for because um, that is, um, uh, more of a challenge. So I hope you found that interesting and I'm happy to take any questions now, Martina or Peter, whoever wants to throw them at me, I'll do my best. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Barry. And I see um, lots of little reactions going there with the thumbs up and the claps. So uh, people are definitely engaging with you the whole way through. Um, you certainly covered a lot. <laughs> we have a few questions for you, okay? Um, so first one up is, can recurrent UTI be connected to rheumatoid arthritis? And if so, where do I go for investigation? So the short answer is yes. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis in itself is a condition that, that it comes from an altered immune system. So you're, by definition, your own immune system is slightly abnormal. You have an autoimmune condition. Um, so you're start, starting off with an immune system that in some ways is right. So that predisposes you to, to any sort of infections. And then I don't know the details, but obviously then sometimes then we come in with different medications that try to block people's abnormal immune system. But the consequences of that can be to block all the bits of their good parts of their immune system. So they in themselves can predispose to infection. So the answer to your question is yes, rheumatoid arthritis can predispose you to infections and possibly your medications. So they are now not even by any means. Lots of people with rheumatoid arthritis and lots of people on medications don't. But if you're predisposed, you do. Um, and I would say the first thing is to do some very basic and standard investigations, even with your GP, in terms of your urine test. Is there infection in there? Um, you can get markers on a simple urine test to make sure it's nothing else. Is it, you know, you can have a, you know, a kidney stone. It mightn't be, or a bladder stone. It mightn't be, you know, it might be something else. You can see traces of blood and stuff. So to start that um, discussion uh, with your rheumatologist, if you're seeing them, but if you're seeing your GP next, whoever you're seeing next, um, say, I'm having these issues. Um, do I need my urine check? You can get a simple, simple urine test can tell a lot of information. Thank you, Barry. Um, so there's another one here. If your CRP is normal and ESR is 27, does that mean it's not RA? Um, and they go on to say my hand is swollen at the back, but they didn't injure it. And I'm totally confused. And the second part of the question, does RA affect the lungs and create nodules? Okay, I'll try to remember those bits. Uh, the first I bit... Do, uh, two <laughs> um. So, so the the blood test, remember blood tests are useful, but don't clinch it. Certainly, so ESOR and CRP that are mentioned there are inflammatory markers. They're a measure of inflammation. They are a snapshot on the day that you take them. Uh, the CRP is more reactive, so it's more reflective on that day and maybe the previous few days. The ESOR is kind of a slower lag, so the ESOR really maybe what's gone on the previous few weeks. So even though we think the ESOR and the CRP tend to move together. They can lag a little bit behind each other. So don't get too fixated with, oh, one is up, one is down, and one is abnormal, one isn't. Um, that, you know, that, that, that 
that can happen. Um, so, so certainly people can come in with swollen joints if you have a swelling in the back of your hand and your blood's maybe half up, half down. You know, that's that can be seen. Maybe uh, we haven't caught the blood test on the right day. So that those blood tests, just without knowing anything else, wouldn't automatically exclude rheumatoid if that's what the thinking is between your GP and your rheumatologist and your symptoms in your hand. So those blood tests wouldn't. So hope that answers that bit. Um, the lungs. So a relatively small, but a percentage of people with rheumatoid arthritis can get nodules, okay? And classically, you might see them on your hands or in your elbows, um, but they're actually small little immune complex depositions that you can get chronically over time. And yes, we see them on people's knuckles and, 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 and elbows, but you can get them in your lungs. So you can get nodules in your lungs. That is really quite rare, but it's a possibility. Separate from that, then you can get just inflammation in your lungs. Um, for sometimes there's a fancy name called interstitial lung disease, which is a type of inflammation um, in your lungs. Again, that is quite rare, but it is a possibility. So you can get two sort of separate things in your lungs from your rheumatoid, both of which thankfully are rare, but they are possible. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, God, the questions are fairly flying in now. So um, this is a question in relation to inflammatory arthritis and a diagnosis of Crohn's. Um, how would you manage the balance of immune, immunosuppressant effects of biologics versus the risk of infection? Yeah, I suppose that is the world that we live in, and that's our job to balance that risk. Um, I suppose that the nice thing as time has gone on is with the advent of newer therapies, our treatments that we used 20 odd years ago extensively, both for Crohn's or, or, or for rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, uh, were quite blunt instruments in some respect. They just sort of kind of suppressed all your immune system. And we were grateful for that, but that would have quite a suppressing effect. Um, with the advent of new what we call targeted therapies, they pick one part of the molecule that's or one part of the inflammatory process that's important and block that um, and do that really effectively. So being kind of game changers for a lot of patients. And the nice thing, they leave all the other bits totally intact to work and fight infection. Now, if we happen to block the one bit that's important for you or important for your specific infection, yes, we will run into trouble. But thankfully, and we need to monitor you and maybe adjust treatments accordingly, but if we leave the rest of your immune system fight and fit, uh, that gives you a really good chance. And that's why the majority of people on these new treatments tolerate them and get none or no more infections than me. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, so this person has PSA and they have a particular problem with hip, but uh, always walked a lot. Um, so their question is, should I walk through the pain? And is there a recommended level of daily moderate activity? So this is the thing, I was at a big, the big American rheumatology meeting is the big kind of world meeting every year. And last year there was, there was a big session on osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis. And this big speaker gave this talk going, oh, things not to do. And her big thing was don't use the term wear and tear. It's not very effective that we wear and tear out our joints because in the second sentence, we'd say patients, oh, you need to be more active. And in fairness, they don't, those two sentences don't make any sense together. Um, what she didn't provide me with is an alternative to the phrase wear and tear. But anyway, that's talk for another day as to why she didn't. But there is a balance between, and I have always balanced on the side of keeping people active, moving, fit, exercising, uh, rather than saving their joints and holding back. So obviously acute pain or new pain or, you know, that needs to be looked at. But if you have a level of pain in your hips and you are able to walk through it within reason, I think that is that is an OK option. Because the um, just the benefits of being active, keeping your muscles strong and your tendons and ligaments are, are so. So there's no call off, say, oh, do 5,000 steps, you'll be fine. Do 7,000, you'll be in trouble. I'm afraid it just doesn't work like that. Um, so there are different levels for different people. But uh, if your pain is chronic and has been assessed, I would say walk through it to a certain degree. If it's new, acute, different changes, that needs to be looked at. Great stuff. Thank you, Barry. And there's a lot of questions coming in here and there's a lot specifically on 
uh, drugs, biosimilars, drug treatments, and I'm sort of thinking leave them to next week. Um, there's also one there on the self management of pain that I would nearly steer you to. Where I'm going to tell you a bit more about our Living Well with Pain program. Really that I think that, that there could be good information there for you on that. Um, there's a question here, and we see about there's a couple here on fibromyalgia. Um, yep. so what 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 do you advise for people with chronic widespread pain? but also suffer with post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation, which makes exercise very difficult. Yeah, like this is this is challenging and that, that is not uncommon to get in the fibromyalgia kind of chronic musculoskeletal pain world, that it's the balancing act between encouraging activity and exercise um but it has to be done at such a kind of gradual and slow uh, level so as not to push it beyond that point where people then you know the whole boom and bust you know the way you feel great today and you go and walk for two hours and then you pay the price tomorrow like if i walk for two hours today i pay the price tomorrow so that that you know it is you know even on good days you need to be realistic you need to set yourself targets you know i'm only going to walk for 10 minutes every day this month that might be not and not 11 minutes not one minute more and then next month i'll go to 15 and not one minute more and that, that is frustrating because it it's so slow but you know you know a patient in my clinic today and we were talking about this sort of thing and i was saying you need to work with me but give me the chance i'm not saying you're going to be great by christmas you're, you're just not christmas is too close christmas is close um it's only a couple of months away you will hopefully be starting to feel better but we need a longer picture here we need to build this up so so gradually that you know i will hopefully have you a whole lot better christmas 12 months bit by bit you'll be better but to gradually 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 particularly on the exercise front and as i said 20 times I'd say so far, I'm a big fan of exercise, but, and that's easier said than done. So if you can get it done under supervision, whether that's with physiotherapies or the programs run through Arthritis Ireland, or, or even, you know, if you have a personal trainer or someone, but no, but someone needs to be clued in and not say, you know, you can go to a crazy gym class and they'll go, come on, like, let's do 20 yeah. more. Like, that's just totally, totally wrong for people with chronic pain. Yeah, you need to be in the hands of someone that knows what's going on. Great, great, thank you. Great question. Um, how should you take paracetamol? Regularly. It's as simple as that. Regularly. Um, pain is, you know, pain goes up and pain amplifies and stuff. And, and paracetamol isn't strong, but it is a good painkiller. But if you're starting off with your pain, take I'm taking to paracetamol, the pain is here. That's going to be so hard to bring it down even any bit. Whereas if you take it regularly and your pain kind of stay that more of a regular level so easily three times a day and um, it's going to control it better you won't allow yourself well, i'll only take it when i get bad that's trying to bring a pain down from an ace and it is paracetamol at the end of the day and <laughs> uh, you buy it across the counter you know use paracetamol when your pains are three fours and fives and not maybe sixes to keep it at twos and threes so take it regularly three times a day and um, that's the best way to take paracetamol Thank you. Um, great question too. So how do you know what type of arthritis you have? I.e. is it RA or is it another type? How is it diagnosed and can there be overlaps? This is a big question as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my whole uh, my whole rheumatology career in one question. Um, that's what I do and I still, that's what I do all day every day and I love it. Um, I love what I do. People come in to me with I always look, people go into a diabetic clinic and they have diabetes because their sugars are up. Or people go into the thyroid clinic because their thyroid blood test is up and their blood pressure. Um, and that's great for those people. But people come into me with a constellation of symptoms, usually. Um, and my job is to try and tease that out. Um, the majority have non-inflammatory conditions. A minority have inflammatory. 90% um, of the time, by the time I've taken your full history and i've examined you i have a good idea at least what group you'll fall into and then i use blood tests and x-rays maybe to clarify things but there are things i listen for in how you describe your symptoms there's things i listen for in when people describe their associated symptoms what they've done what makes it better what makes it worse and then obviously when i examine people swelling what what joints are affected what times of the day is worse what are their other symptoms 
And it's like a jigsaw. And I love putting the pieces together and trying to figure out what's going on with people. And blood tests and x-rays play a role actually honestly only 10% of the time. They're useful, but um, that's, so that's, that's, I don't know if that really answers, but it's probably as good an answer as I can give yeah. in a period of time. Because I remember when, you know, people are struggling with tests and x-rays and imaging and, and MRIs and whatever, the, and you covered that, the diagnostics are usually to eliminate something rather than actually diagnose something. So, you know, it is, it, it unfortunately can take a lot of time. Um, speaking of time, we are running out of time rapidly. Um, and so I'm going to have to uh, close the questions for now. Anyway, a lot of the questions that people are asking um, what I would suggest is you can go to our uh, helpline and or you could go to our website. I'm just going to put some slides up for you um, that uh, there's um, a lot of information there. There's specific videos on specific conditions. There's uh, great uh, interviews with consultants about the likes of lupus, RA, osteoarthritis. So it's great. Um, it's a great source of information to understand your condition. And um, what I would say too is, over the next few weeks, as you can see, we have um, we have another five. Um, we have another five. Um, uh, webinars coming up, and I just lost page there and uh, we've got next week we've got pain and medication the following week we've got pain and exercise and I know there's quite a few questions there on exercise and we have two physiotherapists uh, talking about that and about pacing yourself and when is it dangerous as you covered Barry about you know when when is it too much or whatever mind in our joints a really interesting one on pain inflammation and diet and it's a very interesting topic and we have a consultant rheumatologist that will really go go there with diet and the role of inflammation in the in food we're eating and that's inflammation in the body. Area, Martina, it's fascinating, and that talks yeah. about really, really, yeah. an untapped, not untapped, but it, it, we are we're only starting to scratch the surface on our on our understanding of, of that. So that will be really interesting. Yeah, I, I know you hear all the myths of, you know, oh, candy tomatoes or candy lemons and whatever. So it's myth busting as well, you know, and, and really getting, you know, the importance of how we eat and everything. Um, and because we're, I suppose, we're in Mental Health Awareness Month too, we're also looking at pain and mental health. And you mentioned the pain and the emotions already, Barry. So we're going to look further at that and how, you know, the lack of sleep and fatigue can affect our mental health. And then in spite of all of those and all the challenges of that, we want to finish with something of hope and, you know, something constructive that we can bring forward about, you know, uh, communicating better with our families, communicating better with others and, you know, finding ways to relax and look after ourselves, you know, and being really, um, really managing better. I mentioned this already and it's something we haven't done before. Um, most of you probably would be aware of the Living Well with Arthritis program that we deliver. Uh, this one is specifically Living Well with Pain, and it's an evidence-based program uh, from the SMRC Self-Management Resource Centre at Stanford. And so it's evidence-based and it's specifically looking at some of the things you touched on tonight, Barry. You sold it for us already. The boom and the bust you know, the pacing yourself, the managing sleep, managing the emotions, looking at our mental health. So there's, uh, that's actually gone live on Eventbrite this evening and uh, it is up on our website on arthritisireland.ie. It's a free program. The good news is that it's all online so you don't have to travel um, and it's more interactive. I know tonight we're not really interacting other than the Q&A, but you know, you'll you'll have an opportunity to be, to be on screen and to put things into practice and, and interact with other people living with pain as well. Um, and there's different times. It's on in the daytime. And it's also one in the evening time for anybody that's working or caring for others or whatever. I um, just want to bring your attention to uh, membership of Arthritis Ireland and signing up for our monthly easing where you can find out about all things Arthritis Ireland and activities, courses, campaigns and events. And, you know, we have a really good uh, Mindful Mondays blog. It's recently started and it's really positive, filled with helpful tips and, you know, information on how to stay on top of your health and well-being. And live better and of course i didn't mention this already but our inflammation nation is our podcast series um so if you were struggling you know pop in the the ear pods and have a listen to something you know and there's 
loads of topics. They're all on the website um, or for where you normally would get your podcast from. You can link into it. It's really good. Um, you know, we mentioned, you know, the RAs, the osteoarthritis and um, some of the conditions already tonight. We actually have booklets, patient information booklets on our website that you can download if you want to find out more about your condition, if you're newly diagnosed if you're wondering about a diagnosis or if you're thinking you already have arthritis or if you're living with it for a long time, it's a great resource of information for you too. And everything we do, um, including this webinar tonight, will be on our YouTube channel um, and all our videos and whatever are on there as well. So um, for, that's me for that. I just want to remind you too, just in case you're getting random emails uh, from Eventbrite, we'll be sending you another email on Tuesday with the recording of the webinar tonight. And also a reminder that it's on again next Thursday. Okay, so that, um, that leaves me just to thank everybody for attending. Thank you for your participation and your questions. I'm really sorry we didn't get them. We didn't get to everybody's tonight. Um, I hope you do engage with us. I hope you do take this information forward. Go and sign up for a Living Well with Pain program, you know, and that uh, you get the information and the supports that you need. Or Peter is um, our helpline coordinator. So, you know, give Peter a shout tomorrow or next week and he'll be able to answer your questions and, you know, and have a chat you know, with any of the people on the helpline. And they've been there. They understand it. They get it. You know, um, you know, and they'll be able to be a good ear for you and, and you know, signpost you the right way for what you need. OK, so hopefully we'll see you next week. And Barry, thank you so much for your time tonight. No Fabulous problem. presentation. And, um, you know, I know I learned stuff as well. So and that's great. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you. OK. Thanks,